Our featured speaker today is Scott Onetto, who is a farm advisor with the University of California Cooperative Extension, serving El Dorado, Amador, Calaveras, and Tuolumne counties. Scott has been with the UC Cooperative Extension for 24 years, serving in various capacities as a researcher, educator, and administrator. He possesses a bachelor's degree in botany and a master's degree in weed science, both from UC Davis. And as a weed scientist, much of his research focuses on developing weed control strategies and preventing the spread of non-desirable plants. So over the past 20 years, he's developed control strategies for several weeds, including scotch broom, tree tobacco, periwinkle, hound's tongue, oblong spurge, skeleton weed, medusa head, stinkwort, and others. Um, and I had the pleasure of meeting Scott at the California Invasive Plant Council Symposium last fall. So thanks so much for continuing this networking, Scott, and for sharing your work with us today. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and uh, good morning, everyone, and happy new year. It's great to start off the year talking about invasive plants. And um, yeah, it's just thrilled to, uh, to be invited uh, to, to share with all of you some of the work that I've been doing up here in the Sierra Nevada foothills. And hopefully uh, some of these projects that I'm going to share today will hopefully have some interest and value to all of the work that you all are doing. Um, yeah, so uh, again, my name is Scott Onetto. Uh, my contact information will be on the first slide here. So let me go ahead and share that. And so hopefully that slide should be up. So yeah, my contact information is here. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, anytime after uh, this uh, seminar, uh, if you have any questions about anything that I presented or um, yeah, anything else. So um, yeah, uh, I thought I would share a couple of different topics today. The first one is on a project um, developing a control strategy and then also implementing actually a control program for a invasive plant called oblong spurge or uh, euphorbia oblongata. And I thought this one would be uh, kind of interesting maybe to uh, to some of you that work in and around the um, uh, the Bay Area as uh, this plant in our area occurs uh, primarily along the McCallamy watershed and the McCallamy watershed of course provides uh, drinking water to uh, much of the East Bay. So um, a little bit about this this plant and why it's important. This, uh, this is um, oblong spurge here in the picture with the beautiful McCallamy River behind it. And as you can see, it's got these beautiful yellow flowers that um, you know persist well into the dry summer months here in California. Um, as with many of our invasives, it is uh, an introduced ornamental. So it was brought into uh, the Americas and ultimately into California as an ornamental back in the early 1900s, uh, mostly from areas around the Mediterranean, so Europe and uh, around Turkey. It's got several different common names, as you can see here. The most common, I would say, is oblong spurge, and it gets that from um, its leaves are uh, very oblong uh, or lanceolate in shape, and so that's where it gets its common name. Uh, but it also, you'll hear it uh, called either Balkan uh, spurge because of the, again, its region of where it's native to, and then also um, egg leaf spurge is another one. Um, it is in the Euphorbia family, so it's related to other things, of course, in that family. Uh, but probably the most common one that many of us think of uh, um, would be something like uh, poinsettias or uh, other spurges um, uh, like spotted spurge. It's a, a very common uh, uh, weed that we get in and around uh, landscapes or ornamental gardens. Um, in terms of its spread here in the U.S., it's mostly a problem here in California and uh, along the Pacific Northwest. In California, we see it primarily along the Sierra Nevada foothills. Uh, so, um, of course, in my region, as Shoba mentioned, I cover uh, basically four counties right in the middle of the Sierra Nevadas, and it's a, a major problem in those four counties. Um, and then, of course, it moves in drainages and waterways, and that's where we primarily find it. And so it, of course, moves across the, uh, the, the state of California through the Central Valley and then into the, the Bay Area and pretty much um, a good portion of the, the coastline. Um, it's mostly found along riparian areas, stream corridors. It's a perennial, and so it does do best when there's adequate soil moisture, but 
uh, it's been interesting in the last 10 or so years that I've been working on this plant. Um, I'm now starting to find it more in drier sites, um, in hill, sli hill slopes. Um, actually, it's moving into uh, grazing areas um, and um, in dry land pastures. And so where I thought it was originally confined to some of these wetter areas, it's now occurring um, in some of these drier sites as well. And um, the other, I guess, probably where we're seeing a lot of it is in recently burned areas. It uh, seems like it's moving into those areas where we have these catastrophic wildfires. Um, if it is present in those areas, it's just making these huge massive runs um, immediately after the fires. In terms of its legal status, uh, it was classified as, if you're familiar with CDFA's ranking, um, uh, basically has this A, B, C, and um, Q categories. Uh, it was listed as a class B noxious weed, which gave it actually a, a fair amount of um, local county uh, regulatory action. So ag commissioners at the county level could take um, uh, action on it. Um, and that was up until 2021. And then it changed um, outside of a class B noxious weed to now it's just listed as what is called the CCR 4500 list. And so, um, so it basically, I would say it's been delisted a little bit. Uh, in terms of um, its regulatory uh, uh, ability. Um, to give you a, just a, a little bit closer glimpse of where this plant occurs, this is just a, a snapshot from uh, Calflora's database. If you ever use Calflora for uh, looking at where plants occur in the state, uh, it gives you some really great information. Not to say it's only where plants occur, but um, it's uh, a, a good snapshot of where plants um, have been recorded um, and so, you know, this could be done by regulatory agencies or just citizen scientists that want to um, uh, to, to map plants occurrences. Um, as you can see, again, it uh, occurs uh, very heavily again in the, the central uh, part of the Sierra Nevada foothills, and then um, through uh, much of the uh, the Bay Area and the Central Coast. So, hopefully, folks um, are familiar with this plant. If not, after today, hopefully, you'll be on the lookout for it. Um, so. As I mentioned, it's in the Euphorbia family, so it does produce this white latex uh, sap. And um, the, of course, the sap can cause um, uh, dermatitis and it can actually cause uh, burns of the, if you get it in your eyes, you can actually cause lesions in your eyes. Uh, so it's basically a pretty strong irritant and um, it is classified as basically a, a non-desirable or even sometimes a, a a poisonous plant in terms of uh, grazing for any type of native browsers or livestock. Um, they just pretty much stay away, stay away from it. It also causes, uh, has a tendency to grow in these very large, um, I guess you could say monocultures. And this is uh, kind of where I got um, really involved in working with this plant um, is this particular patch is, as you can see from the photo, it's kind of occurring in a mixed conifer forest. This is in Amador County at elevation about 2,000 feet. Um, and I'd say this is getting towards its upper elevation range. Uh, but you can see it's doing quite well and it's not in a riparian area right here. Um, it's basically, uh, you know, just growing in the understory of this conifer forest. And this is a, a subdivision in, in the county of Amador owns uh, this little island, I guess you could say, right here in the middle of this subdivision. And they got called out to basically do some vegetation control um, several years ago. And so they sent a, a several workers out there uh, as part of the maintenance uh, crew to, to take care of this. And they went out there with weed whackers and weed whacked it. And unfortunately, uh, several of them, again, you, again, you could probably see where the story is going. That white latex um, sap, you know, got on their skin and then their faces on their eyes. And several of them, of course, had to um, go and seek medical attention. And so after that sort of happened, they um, had come to me and said, hey, what is this plant? You know, um, and, it, you know, what happened to our workers? Was it from the plant? And yes, yes, and all those things. And so basically they're like, you know, how do we control this? You know, weed whacking is really not an option, um, you know, unless you're, you know, basically in a space suit. So, um, so that really kind of got my attention to the severity of this plant. And so from there, we um, basically started trying to get a better feel for its distribution. And so this is um, just a, a map of uh, Amador County right here in the center. And all of the white areas basically represent 
um, uh, either entire parcels or uh, patches of where oblong spurge um, is occurring in, in the county. And as you can see, the vast majority of it, it is on that kind of southern border, which of course is um, the McCallany River. So that's kind of where it, it got its, I would say, probably its foothold in the county. And then it's kind of been spreading out into smaller um, uh, riparian streams and drainages. And now we see it, you know, again, growing in these uh, drier upland sites. So, um, yeah, so this is, um, it again, along just what happens um, there where we see it in Amador County. Um, and I'm not sure if I if show up, I should be stopping when I see these poles, intermittent poles pop up or just keep on rolling. You can keep okay. on rolling. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, so this is again along the McCallamy River and this is what we see. We see it kind of growing kind of on the upper banks. Um, and so when we wanted to start looking at how to control this plant, um, I started looking in the literature to see what kind of control strategies have been um, developed in the past. And unfortunately, nothing really um, existed out there. There's, again, many other types of spurge species. Um, and unfortunately, just nothing had been done on oblong spurge. And so that kind of piqued my interest to um, try some uh, different um, uh, techniques for controlling this plant. And with those kind of things in mind, um, you know, with it occurring near water, um, of course, you know, in developing a control strategy, I wanted to kind of sort of keep these things in mind in terms of, you know, when a weed occurs close to water, um, you know, the, consider it sort of a sensitive habitat. There's sort of this public perception and acceptance of doing any type of um, weed control strategies um, in and around water. And then if we were going to use herbicides, you know, whether or not those herbicides um, have any type of selectivity, but also uh, whether or not they um, are allowed to be uh, used in and around water were all kind of considerations I wanted to use. So, um, so yeah, so roughly about five years ago, six years ago, I decided to do a, um, a research trial looking at some different herbicides um, for controlling, again, oblong spurt because nothing had really been tested in the past. And so, um, these are just some of the herbicides. These are the herbicides that I used. Um, as you can see, some of them are non-selective herbicides, um, something like you know glyphosate, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with, a very non-selective herbicide that kills anything. Um, uh, Amazapir also being a non-selective herbicide. And then um, a variety of uh, broadleaf selective herbicides, including something like triclopyr or fluoxapyr or aminopyrrolid or a combination of, of those. Um, and so those were the herbicides that uh, we had picked to put in the study. And we, again, tested those um, at different rates, basically a low rate and sort of an, a, a higher rate um, to see whether or not there was uh, changes or differences in efficacy um, when using uh, each of those herbicides. And then the other thing that, you know, interests me when doing, you know, um, sort of weed control work in these sort of um, non-crop wildland areas is how to apply that pesticide in, I guess you would say the um, most um, uh, safest manner to avoid non-target injury um, and to basically, you know, limit the amount of pesticide that you're potentially putting out in the environment. And so I wanted to try a couple of different herbicide application techniques. And the the two that I use, I'll um, I'll refer to one as a, a broadcast application, and that's probably what most people are familiar with. Um, you know, that's where you may have a, a backpack sprayer, or maybe it's a, a pull behind, you know, ATV uh, with a, a tank on the back, and you have some type of you know a wand with either a, a flat cone no nozzle that's shown here with this red nozzle, or maybe it's a adjustable full cone nozzle. But basically, in that kind of application method, you're um, you're basically spraying the plant to wet. You're basically doing a foliar application, trying to you know get the entire uh, canopy of that plant covered in the herbicide solution. Um, and with that type of application, we often see herbicide application rates in terms of what the spray solution looks like, anywhere from I'd say at a minimum of 20 gallons of spray solution per acre up to I've seen people apply as high as 150 or even 200 gallons of spray solution per acre. 
Um, and not to say those numbers are good or bad, it's just that's what people are using in order to get that full coverage. And so we just have to keep that in mind if that's how much um, herbicide application or spray solution is going out on the landscape. Um, so I wanted to test that method versus this other method that I call the drizzle or low volume um, technique that I had learned about many years ago um, from a weed scientist in Hawaii, where um, they basically do a very uh, concentrated low volume application to treat wildland weeds. And so in that method, um, they, instead of again, spraying the entire canopy to wet, they basically want to just try to drop um, uh, herbicide droplets that are higher concentration onto portions of the canopy. And so in this method, um, I use a uh, basically a, a, this a gun, aluminum gun that kind of looks like a paint sprayer gun. And on the end of that gun, it just has a little single orifice disc or a hole in it that sends out this uh, herbicide stream that then breaks up into these very large droplets. And with this type of application method, rather than the 20 to up to 150 gallons of spray solution per acre, um, with this one, we calibrate ourselves down to two gallons of spray solution per acre. So um, try to just get a visualize of that, you know, 150 gallons of spray solution per acre versus two. Um, it's a lot less volume of um, solution going out onto, onto the landscape. So, um, you know, some of the, I guess, the things that attract me to this particular drizzle application is um, if you are using a backpack, it's there's so many advantages. Um, just the reduced weight of how much material you're having to carry out into um, these areas is, you know, tremendous. You know, carrying even if you're down at 20 gallons per acre, 20 versus two, you know, I can cover two gallon. I can cover basically if I carry a four gallon backpack, I can spray two acres uh, with this drizzle technique. Versus if I'm applying at 20 gallons per acre. Um, I'm going to need to take, you know, basically I need to make five trips back and forth with that four gallon sprayer to, to treat any one, a single acre. So um, the reduced weight um, also, as you can imagine, because we're applying less material or less volume, um, you treat those, uh, those acres much faster. Um, and I see greater accuracy with this again, because we're not treating entire plants. Um, you're kind of almost like Zorro out there on the landscape. Uh, basically, you know, just hitting individual plants with that shoot, that single stream, um, and just trying to get a couple of droplets on it. Um, and you don't have to go up to individual plants to treat them. Like with something like this, um, I can treat plants up to about 20 to 30 feet away um, uh, versus having to go up with, again, that sort of wand or that broadcast method. I may have to walk up um, actually to the plant and be within a couple of feet from it. So, so those are all some of the um, advantages that I see with using this technique. So just to visualize what this looks like, um, in this example, um, this is again that broadcast application where maybe we're applying 20 gallons of spray solution per acre. And if I'm applying it at the, the herbicide at one quart, that represents that blue um, quantity in this 20 gallons. Um, that's kind of what this you know, visually looks like on the landscape. Uh, as compared to that drizzle technique that I just described, again, at two gallons of spray solution per acre, we're still using the same amount of herbicide, the one quart per acre. Um, we're just putting it into a more concentrated form. Um, so hopefully that helps with the visualization, but we're still using the same amount of actual product uh, per acre. It's just um, in the way that we're actually making that delivery. And then, you know, to further calibrate this down, um, this is what this looks like in terms of visualizing what two gallons of spray solution looks like on the landscape. Um, it basically works out to be, if you think of a dropper, it works out to be about three drops per square foot. So if you had like a sheet of paper, roughly um, putting three drops on that sheet of paper is a kind of equivalent to what two gallons looks like on, um, on the landscape. So this is um, one of our uh, uh, county uh, um, biologist uh, doing an application of the drizzle technique on oblong spurge after uh, the after the herbicide trial that I did uh, just to kind of show you what um, what that application looks like so you can see she, she's treating about 30 feet out um, and you know roughly 30 to 40 feet wide um, and again just kind of 
um, broadcasting or drizzling that um, herbicide solution uh, across that, um, that little section and then moving on. So um, I showed you the list of the different herbicides and rates that, um, that we use. And um, this is basically percent control of oblong spurge from, from that single, a single herbicide application uh, one year after treatment. So we made the treatment um, and we, you know, of course, evaluated it at three months, six months, nine months, and then eventually one year after treatment. And this is percent control. And this is kind of like, you know, this is exactly what you would, you know, kind of hope for in terms of, you know, to see differences in herbicide efficacy at different rates. Um, and you can see that some of them just did not perform at all. I mean, almost providing 0% control. Um, and up until this study was done, a lot of the work that had been been being done on oblong spurge was using um, glyphosate. And if you um, look here in the middle, I don't know if my um, cursor shows up here, but in the middle of the screen here, you can see um, glyphosate, or in this case, we were using Roundup Pro at 32 ounces, so basically one quart and two quarts to the acre as a foliar application. You can see it provided less than 20% control. And so um, I think that was one of the um, reasons why we weren't seeing much um, work actually being accomplished or even done on this particular weed is because people were, you know, making applications, they weren't working, and so they would just say, forget it, this plant, you know, isn't controllable. Um, and so uh, working across this, I'm not going to go through every single one, but I'm just going to um, point out the last three bars here. Um, these were all uh, uh, amazapir uh, treatments. So amazapir is a ALS inhibitor herbicide. Basically, it's a non-selective herbicide that um, that inhibits the formation of a couple of amino acids in, in plants. And you can see that um, these three um, amazapir treatments provided the highest level of control. And the actual best one was the amazapir treatment um, applied as that low volume drizzle technique. It actually provided 100% control. There was no oblong spurge one year after treatment. And so um, that became sort of, okay, this is sort of um, how we're going to try to uh, tackle this plant. And so from this work, um, I worked with the, the County of Amador to sort of develop a, a countywide um, spray project for oblong spurge, where as I showed earlier, we mapped it, um, and then they went out and uh, received some front funds from the California Department of Food and Agriculture to, uh, to start doing some um, targeted spot treatments of oblong spurge in the county. So we trained the ag biologists on, you know, how to calibrate equipment and how to properly do the drizzle technique and um, did some public outreach to the community about the project and uh, brought on a bunch of different um, collaborators uh, and county partners to, uh, to, to basically allow us to, uh, to go on their property, including folks like Bureau of Land Management and East Bay Municipal Utilities District um, and several others. And so just to give you a, a little uh, uh, insight on some of the things we, we use, we did some public outreach, as I mentioned. So I developed a uh, flyer that we sent out to uh, individual landowners that talked about the problem and the control project. Um, and then this was basically the, the treatment uh, based on that work that I had done. Um, we decided to use a, a product in the, the, the trial that I did, I used a product that was labeled as Chopper um, and um, same same active ingredient, Amazapir, um, but then they decided to use this particular project or product, Amazapir 4SL, which um, has an aquatic label. So um, you can see in this description here, it's for the control of undesirable vegetation and forestry sites, aquatic sites, pastures, rangelands, um, and the list kind of goes on and on. Um, and it's a caution material. And as I mentioned, it um, does have uh, aquatic uh, registration. Um, it was applied at uh, 24 ounces to the acre, um, mixed with a um, uh, modified seed oil, Hasten EA, which is basically a, a surfactant, and um, again was applied using that drizzle technique at uh, two gallons per acre. So calibration is super important. Um, you know, as you can imagine, um, you know, it's uh, if you're not calibrated at two gallons per acre. Um, you could very easily go way over 
um, uh, in terms of over applying. So it's really, really important for folks to know um, how to, uh, to calibrate your equipment if you're gonna use a technique like this. So just a couple of before and after pictures. Um, the picture on the left is uh, uh, just before treatment in June of 2020, and then a month later, uh, that same hill slope with, um, you can see the oblong spurge starting to turn that reddish orange, uh, which often you see with some of these ALS inhibitor herbicides. Um, and going back to that picture that I showed on my opening slide again, um, that patch is completely taken out um, uh, several months later. So just in terms of measuring success with this particular project, as I mentioned, we um, kind of started it. We did a mapping, uh, we're using a, a mapping program um, where biologists can uh, map individual populations. And so right now we're, I think it's just, a, I think this slide is a little bit old, but um, they've mapped over 137 acres of oblong spurge in just Amador County alone. Um, and they've treated um, as, as this the map, this they've treated about 62 acres um, and again, these numbers are a little bit old, but kind of gives you the sense of um, kind of the progress that they're that they're making. So as they go out and map acres, they get put on this map, and then when they go and actually treat it, they update the map, and um, it keeps track of that. So it's been super helpful for for them to you know um, to incentivize you know they're seeing their success. So just to to wrap up, maybe with this um, with this project, you know, I think um, you know as you can see, a Mazapir. I uh, was very successful in controlling uh, oblong spurge as a one-time application. Um, and even though it is a non-selective herbicide, we could be fairly selective in terms of um, just killing that plant using this very directed uh, low volume drizzle technique. And um, again, don't probably need to, to reiterate all of those advantages of the drizzle technique, but um, yeah, if, if you do any type of wildland work with herbicides, um, certainly um, uh, look into this kind of treatment because depending on the plant and the situation, it could be a game changer for you. Um, and then the, the partnerships um, were just completely, um, the, the success of this project was completely dependent on those, those partnerships. Scott, could we pause yeah. for a second to take sure. some questions on that yeah. Yeah. section? Yeah, happy um, to. Great. So we had a couple come in in the chat and I did also see a hand up um, one of the questions in the chat had to do with when you were comparing the drizzle versus other techniques, um, is the amount of active ingredient applied roughly the same in the exactly. end? Yeah, so exactly. Great question. And so, yes, the amount of herbicide actually applied in those two um, different treatment types is exactly the same um, or are often the same. They don't have to be, but in the case of that I showed, yes, it was the same amount of herbicide used in the broadcast and the same amount in the um, in the drizzle technique. Just the only thing that changed was the amount of water that that herbicide was mixed into. Okay, uh, we've got a question about whether the application that had 100% efficacy did that result in residual soil activity. Yeah, great question. And um, so for those that may or may not know about the Mazapir. Mazapir um, does have a fair amount of soil residual. Um, so it is a, both a, a post-emergent herbicide, but also pre-emergent and that has soil activity. And so I think one of the reasons we were seeing 100% control and no germination that next year uh, was because of that um, soil activity. So um, usually with a Mazapir, um, it can be depending on the rate and how it's applied, you might get as much as three months or maybe even six or nine months of soil activity. Um, the thing that I think with this particular plant, because you know, with if you're gonna do an herbicide application for pre-emergent activity where you want soil activity to you know, prevent any seedlings from germinating, you typically have to do a broadcast application where you're basically putting on you know, a very even, um, application of that herbicide solution across the entire area. And that's, we're not doing that with this drizzle technique. So, you know, we're basically putting droplets across the landscape. And so I'm not so sure that, um, I think the majority of the oblong spurge that we're seeing 
isn't necessarily from seedling germination. I think it's mostly, it's got a crazy rhizomatous root system. And so, you know, I think these very large monoculture patches are mostly coming up um, from um, asexual propagation. Basically, it's, you know, we're basically just sending up new plants from parent plants. Um, and so I think, you know, the herbicide is mostly working as a post-emergent rather than a pre-emergent, even though Amazapir does have a lot of pre-emergent activity. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got a couple more questions. What is the brand of the drizzle gun? Oh, um, it is, I think it might be it. Uh, let me see if I've got one here in my office. Something systems. Um, I will. I know I've got one in my next office over, so I will pop over there maybe at the next break um, and grab it. But it's, um, yeah, something systems. I should know that off the top of my head. <laughs> no worries. Um, we do also have a response in the chat um, that you can you can pretty much convert anything to a drizzle with the right nozzle. Exactly. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I've even, you know, in um, in situations where I wasn't thinking I was going to use my drizzle gun, I've just put an orifice disc on the end of my um, my wand. And so, yeah, it's really about whatever that um, whatever the nozzle is that, you know, is creating, um, you know, the output. So you basically just need to constrict that output or that flow down and put it into a single stream. And I've, I've even, you know, used those adjustable cone nozzles that come with backpack sprayers and dialed it all the way down as tight as I can get it to, to get it a nice stream. Um, it's hard to get it down, the volume down to get it to two gallons per acre, but you could still get a, you can almost get a drizzle technique down with that adjustable cone nozzle, but you'll most likely be applying it closer to like four gallons or maybe five gallons to the acre. Okay, um, we've got a request. If you can show a slide again, um, yeah. it was the one where you had the comparison between the two treatment techniques. Um, treatment techniques, yes, probably yeah. this one here. Is the that the, the one, one with like the buckets. I think it's like the one after that. Thank you. Uh, with the buckets. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. OK, I could leave that up um, for the next question, which was, did the public outreach spark any concerns? And if so, how did you respond to those? Yeah, you know, I think any time we're using pesticides um, in. And I think especially in wildland settings, um, there's and I think it's rightfully so that there the concerns that are raised. And um, in this particular area that we were using some of them, um, a lot of the one stretch of along the McCallamy watershed is um, just has these spectacular wildflower displays in the springtime, mostly of California poppies. And so um, lots and lots of, you know, um, of the public come and, you know, visit these this site and so there was some um, questions raised as to whether or not these applications were going to have any adverse effects not only to the wildflower populations but also um, to water quality or to other desirable plants um, and so we did try to address those um, again I think through this very directed application I think um, after the treatments may were made um, it was very telling that you know it's it's really cool to go into a site and see where oblong spurge is just completely dominating the landscape. Um, and you have some desirable plants trying to come up through like, you know, a variety of different hardwood and also brush species. And then you make the application and you can see all of this dead spurge and those um, desirable plants just, you know, green and lush and thriving up through it. Um, I think it's very telling. And we did not see any adverse effects in terms of the wildflower displays after the applications. I would say to the contrary, we're probably seeing more just because of some of those large patches that are moving up these hill slopes where 
heavily competing with some of the wildflowers. Um, and I guess the other thing that I think maybe um, helped in terms of, you know, just, I guess, expressing how severe of a concern this is, is um, we had a, a pretty large catastrophic wildfire in our area um, about seven years ago it was the Butte fire. And it uh, basically burned along the McCallum watershed. Um, and since that fire, you know, in the years following that fire, we have seen oblong spurge just racing up these um, up these slopes. And so I think the public um, is seeing that as, oh my gosh, this is a concern. We don't want you know all of these areas taken over, you know, by oblong spurge. And so um, I think that helped with some of the messaging as well. Great. Thanks. I'll let you move right along to the next part of your talk. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you for the great questions. Um, okay, so um, this next one is a, a fairly new project. And so I apologize, I'm not going to have tons of, of data, um, but I find it is an interesting one because, you know, one of the things um, I think all of us um, throughout the West and even, you know, um even up into pacific northwest these excuse me these catastrophic wildfires have been occurring more frequently and it seems like larger and larger every year i think we got very lucky the last um last year and um, maybe the year before that we didn't have too many catastrophic fires but um you know in many of the counties that i work in it seems like every year we've been just getting hit with some really large catastrophic wildfires so reducing um, fuel loads has been a, um, I guess, a, a, a driving um, priority for the last few years in terms of, you know, trying to get rid of some of those ladder fuels, reducing uh, the amount of vegetation, um, and trying to open up some of these areas um, just so it reduces the threat of wildfire. And a lot of these projects have been relying on uh, mastication equipment. So if you're um, not familiar with a masticator, it's basically basically um, these large um, heads that can go on the end of a like a, a, a bobcat or on the end of an excavator. And it basically is just a grinder. It basically just grinds vegetation down into wood chips and scatters wood chips across the landscape. Um, so it's really great for, you know, changing how that fuel is out on the landscape. It basically just puts all the fuel down as wood chips on the ground, um, and it opens up, um, you know, the can op opens up that forest or that that brushland um, to again kind of create these fuel breaks. And so we've been seeing, you know, lots and lots of mastication projects happen, but the opposite of what we're not seeing is the maintaining these um, uh, fuel breaks. Um, you know, it seems like they go in and. There's tons of funding to put these fuel breaks in, but then three, four, five years later, um, no follow-up treatments happen. And as a result, they just basically grow back. As most of you know, um, a lot of these species have a tendency to regrow either from their root mass um, and stump sprout, um, or just have um, you know lots and lots of seeds in the soil and they just germ regerminate. And um, you know, after three to five years, you have again basically this uh, shrub component that's just as bad as when you originally did it. And so um, I was approached by our local fire safe council and our local resource conservation district to um, to do this project that basically just started this last spring um, and was to basically create a demonstration for the public to show techniques for controlling brush after a mastication. And so um, the project is located, this is also in Amador County. Um, this is called the Mitchell Mine Fuel Break, and um, it's uh, shown here in blue. Uh, just to give you a, a reference, if you're familiar with this area at all, um, this is uh, Highway 88. So um, basically Highway 88 goes east and west. This is the small town of Pine Grove. And so, um, uh, of course, west would be to our left and east would be to our right. Um, and this, so this shaded fuel break basically goes along a ridge line um, just north of highway, State Highway 88 um, and Pine Grove. And this fuel break was put in uh, roughly about five uh, years ago. It took them several years to do the whole entire thing, but um, much of it is about five years old. 
And as such, um, it's uh, starting to have a fair amount of, of brush regrowth. And so um, this is kind of what the, the sites look like. Um, you, know, you can see there's a fair amount of, so again, immediately after the fuel break, um, they basically leave, you know, sort of this scattered, um, uh, scattered canopy of large mature trees and try to remove much of the understory just to um, to reduce it basically serves as a um, as a shaded fuel break to prevent you know if there was a fire to come through when it reaches these shaded fuel breaks it basically gives fire personnel um, an opportunity to, to to combat that fire and hopefully it basically drops that fire down to the ground or stops it completely so that's kind of the purpose of these shaded fuel breaks um, but as you can see a lot of the the brush and understory is starting to, to regrow. So we have vegetation that's anywhere from, you know, a couple of feet high up to um, some of the trees had regrown um, to six, seven, even eight feet tall um, in some of the plots. So um, the, the purpose of the project was um, we wanted to evaluate a whole suite of treatments, um, both um, mechanical and also um, using chemical methods to find out what's the most economical, um, but also efficient um, and effective at controlling uh, regrowth after these fuel breaks. And we also wanted to look at whether or not non-chemical treatments were as effective as chemical treatments. And looking at chemicals, we also wanted to try some of the organic herbicides because there's been a lot of um, interest in whether or not some of the newer organics that are on the market, whether or not they're effective at any type of vegetation control. So we wanted to, to look at some of those. And then lastly, we wanted to look at um, sort of a comparison of products that individual homeowners might have access to just going to their local hardware store versus um, the more commercially available products that are gonna be used by somebody that goes and gets either an operator identification number um, or um, is using a, a pest control company to, to come in. So wanted to compare those because often the active ingredients are the same. The only thing difference is maybe that percent of the active ingredient or maybe the percents are even the same in some of those products. So we wanted to just evaluate whether or not they work the same. So um, in all, we had 33 different treatments um, that represented a whole suite of different kind of categories um, we used grazing as, as one of the, the retreatments um, for controlling the, the vegetation regrowth, and we used a, a mixture of goats and sheep, and I'll talk a little bit about them in a moment. Um, we did some mechanical treatments where we just used hand tools. Um, we wanted to try whether or not flaming would, uh, would have any success, and then um, there's a, a whole bunch of different herbicides, both um, uh, synthetic and organic that I'll, I'll share with you. So this is just a close-up of that map that I showed you before of that whole entire fuel break. Um, the actual section where the demonstration occur is occurring is this red blob kind of right here in the center. Um, and it's um, we picked this because there's a county road uh, called Lupe Road that runs right through the shaded fuel break. And so um, I'll show you a close up of that here. Um, so this is in the town of Pine Grove. Uh, Lupe Road is a, a county maintained road that goes right down the middle of the shaded fuel break. And you can see from this aerial image what the sort of shaded fuel break does. I mean, you can see how dense the vegetation is um, uh, above and below the actual plots. And then you can see just how open the forest is um, as a result of that mastication. And so along this, um, this section, we basically created these um, basically almost half acre treatment plots. Uh, we wanted them to be fairly large because we wanted to be able to, again, demonstrate to the public that, um, you know, if they're going to take on, you know, these tasks of trying to maintain, um, you know, a mastication project on their own property, you know, this is, the scale that we felt would be appropriate where they could see um, whether or not it would um, be a um, you know, uh, similarity to what they might be battling up against. So um, in all, it's about 17 acres. And we chose again this site because uh, a strong component of this project is educational outreach and 
we want to hold a lot of basically workshops out here to allow people to walk through the plots and really get a sense for how the uh, the, the, the landscape looks both untreated, but also um, if they were going to do one of these uh, treatment types. So um, it actually worked out just perfectly for that. Uh, we did do some pre-measurements uh, this spring before we implemented any of the treatments. Um, we also did some drone imagery that we haven't processed yet. Again, we just started this project this year. So um, we're, you know, just kind of, sorry, our, our admin assistant is on vacation this week. So <laughs> um, that's the doorbell that somebody else can worry about. Um, so anyways, uh, so we did some uh, pre, uh, uh, pre data before we did any of the treatments and basically the pie charts here are just showing on the, the left here. Um, this is kind of a breakdown of what's happening on the landscape across all the plots. And it's basically showing that, um, you know, there's still a fair amount, 68% um, of the landscape is still uh, no vegetation. Um, and 30%, roughly 32% is mixed up of, you know, some type of vegetation. Uh, so this could be annual grasses, broadleaves, shrubs, or trees that's, you know, again, regrowing on the landscape. Um, and then of that 68% of nothing, um, that, that's basically the ground cover component. And the vast majority, over 90% of it, is um, what we categorized as duff, but it's basically um, dead, dead dying or dead uh, vegetation, mostly wood chips. It's, you can see here in this upper photo and even in the below photo, there's just lots and lots of wood chips um, from that mastication treatment that kind of you know, covers the soil and provides a ground cover across um, much of the landscape. So um, as part of the treatment, we did want to leave some untreated areas because we wanted to be able to show, OK, if you do nothing, um, this is what it's going to look like, you know, um, over time. And so uh, these are two of the untreated um, plots. And um, again, it just shows what some of that vegetation regrowth is starting to occur over the landscape. And so again, a lot of these shrubs are anywhere from two feet um, on average, probably about five feet tall. And there are some uh, taller ones um, across, uh, across some of the other plots. So the, the first ones that I um, wanna share are some of the mechanical treatments. And um, the three that I kind of throw in this bucket would be the, 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 the grazing, uh, lopping and flaming. And so if we talk about the um, the ruminants here first, the grazing treatment, um, we contracted with a local contract grazer. And so these have become extremely popular, I would say the last, gosh, five years or so. Um, we've just seen this very large um, increase in the number of folks that um, either have increased their herds or have gotten into the business of contract grazing for vegetation management. And I think it's um, gonna just continue to, um, to, to grow because um, these, these guys are just really, really great at um, doing what they do in terms of eating vegetation. And so uh, this particular contract grazer that we used, he brought in uh, 50, 50 animals. Um, it was probably you know, more animals in terms of density than most would do, but um, we were looking for, you know, basically very quick results. And so um, he brought in 48 goats and two sheep um, and his little buddy, his livestock guardian dog here. And um, they were, this for this particular uh, treatment, I had mentioned that most of the blocks or the treatments were a half acre in size. Um, we doubled this one because um, we wanted to, basically we, we felt a half acre was just too small for a grazing treatment. And so um, for the grazing treatment, that's the only one that's, um, significantly larger. It's about an acre in size. Um, and so they put up, as you can see, portable um, uh, electric netting and uh, they grazed for roughly two weeks. And so, um, yeah, this one, we got a lot of varying comments um, over the course of the summer uh, from the public um, about this project. And, um, you know, this one was by far um, received the most positive um, uh, support in terms of just people love animals and they love seeing animals out on the landscape working. And, you know, when you throw an adorable dog in there too, it's just, um, you know, it just doesn't get any better than that. 
So uh, we paid six hundred and fifty dollars uh, for uh, an acre, and that's about what the going rate is in this part of the state uh, for contract grazing. I've seen uh, prices lower than that, but I've also seen prices um, higher than that as well. Kind of just all depends on the the site. If we look at the um, the results, and I'm gonna I guess um, caution the the when I show the percent control for some of these, um, the the amount of time after the treatment is going to vary. And so this number here that you see, this is two months after treatment. So we evaluated uh, this um, um, two months after they got pulled out. So at that point, when we pulled them out um, and uh, came back two months later, we were evaluating um, the percent efficacy and we rated it basically at 90% control. So um, we're gonna continue to monitor that. We just, again, did many of these treatments over the course of the last six to nine months. Uh, this was one of the last treatments that we did. So this treatment went in in September. Um, and uh, yeah, so we just did the evaluation um, the early part of November. So we'll continue to monitor this next year um, but as you can imagine, with any sort of uh, grazing or mechanical treatment, you know, we're basically just giving these these plants a haircut, just like the original mastication treatment. And so uh, we'll venture to guess that next spring we're going to see a lot more uh, regrowth in this plot. And so we're going to expect to see this number 90 percent continue to drop over time. Um, but again, it could be part of a, a longer story of of maintenance of, okay, you have to go in and regraze um, X number of times or X uh, once every um, so many years to, to keep the vegetation in check. You can see some of the um, after pictures here of just how well they do it, basically just stripping the plants, you know, causing a lot of mechanical injury, you know, they nibble on the bark, they nibble on the stems, um, and then they just completely strip the leaves away. Um, of the, the plants. And so I think that might be all the pictures. Oh, let's see, this upper right hand picture uh, just shows um, the grazing on the right, and um, you can hardly see any vegetation whatsoever. And then uh, the adjacent plot on the left, the control plot. Now, this one is um, the flaming treatment. And so with flaming, um, let's see here. Uh, With the flaming treatment, we are not trying to actually catch the plants on fire, um, but rather we basically are just trying to pass over high intensity heats to basically rupture plant cells. And so, um, you know, this technique is used a lot. Um, I see a lot of home gardeners, home landscapers using it to control annual or basically newly germinated plants, but we've never really tested it on um, you know, perennial shrubs and regrowth. And so we wanted to see whether or not you know, could we actually cause enough foliar injury to um, to either kill the plant or basically injure it um, to some degree? And so, um, the cost of this particular strategy is uh, a bit expensive, as you can see from the numbers here. Um, it took us about, on average, a little over eleven hours of labor uh, per acre, and so just you know, calculating out labor at minimum wage, um, which we're going to do for all of the treatments. We want to do a cost analysis as part of this project. Um, you know, we're looking at about $177 per acre in just labor. And then we used about just shy of 15 gallons of propane per acre. Um, so roughly $70 of propane for this particular treatment. If we look at the um, efficacy of the flaming, um, it wasn't very good. Um, this was six months after treatment. So we did this um, uh, early in the season. We actually treated this in early May. And um, originally it looked really good. When we came back in June, a lot of the plants were um, really blackened and um, didn't look that well. Uh, but then as the summer continued and we got into fall, we just saw more and more regrowth and uh, more recovery. And so, um, yeah, it um, it looked like almost, there was just patches, as you can see in the picture, like something happened, uh, but then you look across the landscape, um, there's a lot of plants that you would, it does, doesn't even look like they um, got treated with anything. So 
Um, so again, we're not uh, too um, uh, too pleased with the efficacy of this treatment, but now we know. Here is um, our lopping treatment. So I mentioned we just used mechanical tool. So used a, a hand axe, we used uh, loppers, used a matic, just um, all sorts of mechanical tools to just, again, to eliminate that uh, above ground vegetation down to soil level. Um, again, similarly, it's uh, pretty labor intensive. Took us um, about, again, 13 hours of uh, uh, labor per acre. Um, and again, depending on that cost, you might be looking at anywhere from $200 um, or more um, if you were to hire that at uh, minimum wage. And then um, in terms of efficacy, again, six months after treatment, um, we thought it did okay, it provided about 70% control um, across the landscape. Again, as with, again, any type of injury, um, you know, depending on that root system, um, plants have a tendency to, to re-sprout and regrow. And that's basically what we were seeing is um, a lot of regrowth occurring. Um, you know, the vegetation was still super small. And so again, this might be one of those things where multiple treatments or repeated treatments would that need to happen to maintain um, to, to maintain that fuel break. But um, yeah, 70% six months after treatment we felt was, um, was fairly good and we'll continue to watch that um, all the way out to one year after treatment. Uh, the other one that included lopping was a sort of a combination of um, lopping and then immediately coming back over with an herbicide application. Um, and so again, the, the, the lopping uh, would have been just like the, the slide before that I showed you. And then the only thing difference is we're adding in an herbicide application immediately over uh, those cut stumps. And in terms of control on this one, um, it just gave slightly better control. We are seeing 80% control six months after treatment. Um, still seeing a fair amount of uh, regrowth. It's all fairly small, um, but we did see some regrowth out there across the landscape. Um, and we're attributing a fair, I, we would have expected to see better control with this for this particular treatment. Um, and I think the um, the downfall to what we saw is that um, we had one person going through and making the, the lopping treatments and then a separate person coming in and doing the application of the herbicide. And sometimes it was hard to find exactly, you know, where to spray on that cut stump because you may have a you know, a fairly, you know, good size area of vegetation that may have been removed and finding just those individual cut stumps, again, because they were down at ground level was sometimes difficult. So I think some of the stuff just got missed. Um, and that's where the breakdown may have happened in terms of the efficacy. Um, I'm going to switch now to the chemical treatments. Um, and as I mentioned, um, this was by far the largest category because we had, um, we wanted to include both sort of the synthetic herbicides, but also some of um, organic herbicides. And so this is the list that I developed in terms of the herbicides that I wanted to, to test. Um, and these are just all of the, the products. Um, and then um, in the next slide, I'll actually show you all the treatments because some of them I used individually some of them I tank mix, some of them I tried at different rates. Um, also, some of them I tried different application techniques like the, the broadcast versus the drizzle. Um, so uh, lots and lots of factors went into um, how these herbicides were applied on the landscape. And looking at this list, a couple of things to point out, I guess, um, is that uh, some of these were non-selective herbicides. So they basically target all plants, whether it be grasses or broadleaf plants. Um, the other thing to point out is that um, some of these were post only, so their post emergent products have to come in contact with green live tissue, um, and some of them had some pre emergent or soil activity. Um, and then the last thing, um, oh, two more things. Um, the I did mention that I tried some organics and the three that I used um, is home plate axe and green gobbler and I'll talk more about those um, in the coming slides about what those products actually actually were. And then lastly, um, 
is the hazard class. And so hopefully everybody's familiar with, um, you know, how pesticides are ranked based on their potential toxicity um, using the three hazard uh, classes of caution, warning, and danger. And of course, caution being the, um, uh, the least um, uh, toxic or hazardous to the, um, uh, the applier or the applicator, uh, warning being the middle, and then of course, danger being the most um, potentially toxic. Um, and we tried to give, I guess I would say, some prioritization to trying to use as many herbicides that had that lowest caution label as possible. Um, and but there was just some products that um, that fell into the the warning and danger. Um, the thing that I'll mention is that um, you'll notice that um, a couple of the organics actually have some of those higher uh, hazard class uh, rankings. So Axe, which is um, one of the organic herbicides, actually carries a warning label. The um, Green Gobbler, which is an acetic acid product, actually carries um, the highest uh, warning, the danger, the danger label. So I think that's often I, a surprise for some folks when we talk about um, uh, the hazard classes with um, with pesticides that you know even though it could be an organic herbicide um, you may have to take extreme caution with some of them especially something like acetic acid where you know it can um, cause irreversible or even blindness um, uh, with with some of those products. So this is the long laundry list of all the herbicides. So um, in all, there was 30 different herbicide treatments. Um, and so this is all of those, all of those products. And so, as I mentioned, you know, some of them were uh, individual active ingredients by themselves um, at different rates. Um, some of them were tank mixes of multiple active ingredients. And um, the other, Thing that we wanted to again also look at is how we apply those herbicides. Again, a traditional foliar application where we kind of spray the entire canopy to wet. And again, um, going back to that previous um, talk on oblong spurge where I compared that broadcast treatment versus the drizzle, basically it's the same idea. So uh, for the foliar applications, we are applying at 20 gallons of spray solution to the acre. Uh, for the low volume drizzle, we were applying at five gallons. We calibrated at five gallons uh, to the acre. And then um, the other thing that we also wanted to look at was treatment time. So um, we wanted to see whether or not some of the herbicides worked better um, or would have different efficacy as a spring treatment versus a fall, um, a fall treatment. And so just to give you a sense of some of these, um, I highlighted here in um, in orange. This is a Cord XRT. This is um, a glyphosate product, and you can see we again tried it um, as a, a foliar versus a, a drizzle technique, and did that in the spring. And we also are doing that same exact uh, two treatments um, as a fall treatment to compare spring versus fall applications of that particular herbicide. And that's mostly based on previous research um, that um, I've done, as well as others that have sometimes shown that depending on the species, sometimes um, products um, work better on certain plants um, at different times of the year. So uh, my experience on some woody plants has been that glyphosate doesn't work well as a spring application. You actually get better efficacy in the fall. So that was one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, to show those two different timings. And then I also mentioned um, we wanted to see whether or not uh, products that might be available over the counter, like Brush Talks, which is a triclopyr ester formulation, um, it would uh, provide the same efficacy as a commercially available product like Garlon 4 Ultra, which is also triclopyr ester. So these products are exactly the same um, active ingredient, um, same percent formulation, um, just ones um, available to somebody that has a permit. Um, and the other one, Brush Talk, is available just over the counter to 
um, to anyone. So we wanted to compare those as well. So um, you've already seen this slide, so I'm not going to um, really uh, describe this slide anymore. Just to, again, we wanted to test those two different herbicide application techniques, the broadcast, which we did at 20 gallons to the acre versus uh, the drizzle, which we did at five gallons uh, of spray solution to the acre. So um, this is just a, another uh, sort of example. This is not this particular project, but just showing um, how we apply that drizzle technique to sort of woody brush vegetation. Um, so you can kind of get, a, get another close up sense of just how that um, material is applied to sort of larger brush species. So this was just a, a blackberry project that I did several years ago um, showing the drizzle technique um, and just showing a close up there of, um, of blackberries growing up into a willow tree and just how you can be fairly selective at you know targeting the um, this in this case blackberries and not injuring uh, the willow tree that um, was providing providing a support for that plant. So um, as I mentioned, I don't have tons of data from this project yet, but um, this is what I do have thus far. And this is um, showing percent control. So similar to that oblong spurge uh, slide that I showed earlier. So the higher the bar, the better control. Um, and this ranges anywhere from three months out to six months after control, because uh, some of these were treated a little bit later than others. Um, and again, I apologize, there's so many on here, but you can just see, again, there's sort of this range in scale of efficacy for uh, different products. Um, I'll, I'll start off with the far left here just to point out that the one that performed the absolute worst um, was acetic acid. Um, this was the green gobbler uh, that I used. It was a 20% acetic acid formulation that was applied uh, just straight 20% acetic acid. It wasn't diluted at all, um, and it provided 10% control um, uh, six months after treatment. The ones that provided the best control, I'm going to go off to the far right here of the screen, um, and the ones that provided the best was um, was kind of a, a an interesting um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, set. And before I talk about those, I, I wanted to point out the color in the, the bars here represent um, something important as well. The blue bars are all those broadcast um, applications where we basically spray to wet. So they were the foliar applications. Um, the yellow bars are the low volume drizzle um, applications. Um, and so that hopefully will help um, give some sense to what some of this is going on as well. So. The thing that I want to point out is that um, the first thing with these, I'll just kind of point out these last six bars. Um, the this uh, this bar here, which is the first yellow bar that's providing eighty percent control. Uh, this was Brush Tox, um, which is that uh, triclopyr product that's available over the counter um, to homeowners as a drizzle technique. It provided. Um, basically 80% um, control. And when you apply it as a foliar application, that is this first blue bar, which is providing 90. So um, either as a drizzle or as a foliar application, that brush talks provided pretty darn good control. Um, similarly, the second yellow bar in this set of three, the middle one here is Garlon 4 Ultra, also as a drizzle technique. Um, it provided 80% control, likewise, um, as a foliar technique, the middle blue bar is also Garlon 4 Ultra. So again, we got just slightly better control when we applied these herbicides as a foliar versus um, a, a drizzle technique. And then the last one is this tank mix that has Garlon, a Mazapir, and a cord in it. Um, and again, uh, providing 80% control, that same exact mix, that same tank mix also provided 90% control as a foliar. So these are basically the same exact um, three uh, applications, one as a drizzle, one as a foliar, and those seem to be some of the top contenders um, so far. There's some others here that are also providing 80% control as well. Um, and I can um, 
uh, for the sake of time, otherwise I'm going to talk too much about those. But again, I, I guess I want to just um, caution the, the statement that this is still very preliminary data. I think until we get out to one year after treatment, um, that'll be sort of the true test and teller of which ones are uh, performing the best in terms of a, a good application. So maybe just a, a few pictures um, to kind of show you what this is looking like on the landscape. This is um, the foliar application of the that tank mix that I just had mentioned that was providing 90% control as a foliar application. And this is um, six months after treatment. This has uh, uh, Garlon 4 Ultra, which is that triclopyr ester formulation, uh, Mazapir, um, and Accord XRT, which is the glyphosate. So a tank mix of three active ingredients um, with uh, modified seed oil, basically hasten um, at 2%. And so you can see a lot of, of brown, brown uh, death out there. Uh, this is that same exact tank mix, but applied as a drizzle application. Um, so slightly less control, uh, but hardly unnoticeable. Um, and I think you, we see a little bit less control um, because we may have just had, again, you're applying so much less volume, you may just be missing um, some plants either completely or uh, partially, um, but still providing really good control six months after treatment. And then um, this is the Garlon 4 all by itself. Um, again, as a foliar treatment, I said that one provided 90% control. And likewise, that same treatment as a drizzle technique, again, providing 80% control. Still really good control with both of those um, two treatments. And just to mention again, I think um, the next slide, Brush Talks, again, is that same active ingredient as the, the previous slide with Garlon 4 Ultra. This is just the over-the-counter product um, that homeowners can buy still the same uh, triclopyr ester um, at the same percentage. Um, and again, as a foliar treatment, providing the same control um, as the Garlon 4 Ultra, and as a drizzle technique, again, providing the same 80% um, control as the Garlon 4 Ultra. So that kind of, you know, proved that, you know, doesn't matter which product you're using, if the active ingredients are the same, um, it's providing uh, the similar efficacy. Um, just, I guess, one thing on, you know, before I get into the organics is that, you know, basically they're working a little bit differently, um, you know, with the other herbicides that we're using, um, they're often synthetic herbicides, meaning, um, you know, they're synthetic, but then they're also um, being taken up by the plant and being systemic. And so, um, you know, those herbicides that I sh just showed you, you know, we're applying them either as a foliar or a drizzle technique, the herbicide's getting on the plant and then it's getting actually taken up into the plant and then translocated or moved in the plant to cause some type of, um, uh, of injury depending on its mode of action. Um, with an organic herbicide, they don't do that. They basically don't get taken up by the plants and translocated. They just basically are causing immediate cell death um, on that plant. They're either breaking down the cuticle, uh, breaking down cell walls, and causing um, basically localized um, uh, uh, death or localized damage. And so the three herbicides that were uh, in this organic category, um, the first one was home plate, and this is a combination of uh, caprylic and capric acid. Um, as I mentioned, it's um, a, a caution herbicide. Um, the second one we used was um, Axe, which is ammonium nonanonate, um, and it was a, a warning. And then I mentioned the Green Gobbler, which is the acetic acid product, um, and that was the, the danger hazard class. So um, I was a bit surprised with these. I, I didn't have a whole lot of... Um, I didn't think that the, the organics were going to work on some of this woody uh, brush regrowth because I've done other projects with organics in the past and um, sometimes they just fell short. Um, and I'd never used um, this particular product before Axe. And to be honest, I was pleasantly surprised at how well it performed. As you can see, um, as it relates to some of the other products, it's kind of you know right in the middle of the, um, of the game, providing about 60% control 
Um, and if we look at what that looks like on the landscape, um, you can see there's a fair amount of localized uh, branch dieback across a lot of the shrubs. Uh, again, it's not systemic, so it's not going to be taken up to the plant and, you know, cause death um, in other areas of the plant. It's completely localized, but um, I was pleasantly surprised at how well this um, this particular product worked. And so this was three months after treatment. Um, I'm expecting to see this number drop over time, just again, because, you know, it's not systemic. And so I'm expecting the the, the plants to be able to to continue to, to regrow and, you know, uh, put on new shoots and stems. But, um, you know, as a multiple application, uh, which we might do, we weren't originally thinking we would make any multiple applications of any of the products, but with um, some of the organics, we're debating on whether or not we may want to make a subsequent application, uh, perhaps one year after treatment, um, just to see if we can get even higher control uh, by making two applications. But this is what it looked like three months after treatment. I'll um, finish with this slide here. This is um, sort of the results of all of the treatments. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, we're super early in this project. And one of our end goals is to develop uh, sort of an economic breakdown of um, all of the treatments in terms of what their cost is and what their efficacy is. And so this is sort of the preliminary uh, data going into it. The, the thing that we're sort of missing at this point is we need to calculate all the chemical costs and we just haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, that'll be something we're gonna be doing probably over the next few weeks or month. Um, so we'll hopefully have that soon. But um, as you can see right now, um, you know, the, the grazing one is probably going to be the most expensive treatment at um, $650 per acre. Um, the flaming and the lopping, the two mechanical treatments are going to be coming in, you know, at also fairly high numbers. Again, just because they're so labor intensive. Um, uh, the uh, lopping and herbicide, of course, is also up there again because it has the same uh, uh, cost in terms of that labor force um, and then the herbicide ones will um, will drill into this a lot deeper and actually have individual breakdowns of all the different herbicide treatments uh, but the thing that i want to point out right now is that main difference between that foliar application versus the low volume drizzle in terms of just the what the labor portion of that looks like um, you know herbicides you know keep that out of it for now but just looking at the treatment time um, and what that equivalents to um, labor, if we look at the herbicide applications, the traditional foliar application, it takes us about two hours to treat an acre um, with a backpack sprayer treating, you know, at 20 gallons of spray solution to the acre. You compare that to this low volume drizzle application where we're applying five gallons to the acre now we're down to 25 minutes to treat an acre. Um, so, you know, you look at the, the labor portion of that, um, just that, you know, in terms of what the labor cost is per acre, you know, we're looking at $30 versus, you know, a little over $6 um, just in labor. And so that decrease in efficacy of 10% that we were seeing, you know, six months after treatment, um, you know, you might be able to justify taking a little less control if you can move across the landscape that much quicker um, and applying that much less herbicide solution volume across the landscape. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of works on that. Um, we have a website that we're just starting to put some of this data on. So if you're you know interested in following up on this project or if you would like to come out to, um, as I mentioned, this is a, a big component of this is to do uh, field days and on-site workshops. Uh, we had a couple last September. We're going to be doing many more this coming year um, in the spring and summer. Um, and so if you're interested in, you know, taking a, a trip out to our area for one of the workshops, um, you know, uh, definitely uh, take a look at the website. We'll be posting all of those on there. And um, yeah, I think with that, I will take it over to this slide and see if um, anybody has any questions or comments.